All right, 710, this is the last one now. Um, more electronic configuration. Six, seven, and eight on the worksheet you'll do now. So yeah, it takes a lot. Like I said, it's a lot of information, but you're gonna find what we're doing right now is probably what the, one of the toughest things in the chapter. And it's not that bad. It's learning, it's just learning the material, but then everything will come from it. So you've done this, now we'll do this. But you'll, you'll see that um, it's mostly informational. And you know, in the next, some lessons away, there'll be some math that comes into play. Um, as you see, I, okay, but anyway, I'll just move on. Yeah, now I did, well actually I can mention this now too, because you notice these lessons, I started, and I pretty much do, I mean, I, unless I assign this in a different order when, I, when you guys view them. But we're starting with 7, 9, and 7, 10 to begin with. So what, you're like, what about 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? Yeah, we're, we're going to do all those before as well. I'll put 7, 10. But um, I just think it's better. This is the most important thing you need to know. And the, a lot of questions, a lot of things come from this. But then the background behind this stuff is what we'll be doing in the next lesson. We'll go back 7, 1, and, and so forth. So that's why I just, I just think it's better to, to do it that way. Okay. I mean, the math, you know, a lot of times I do math early because it's tougher, but this math is not hard when we, when we get to it. It's not today. Okay. Um, back to these worksheets. Okay, I've gone over valence shell. Those are the orbitals where, where the electrons, the outer electrons are found, valence electrons. The shells, yeah, it could be numbers. One, shell number one, two, three, four. Or you can even say the valence specific in level three, but level three P, three P would be the, you know, or, or three S. Okay. Um, ion, talk about that. Okay. So, okay, here we are. More electron configuration concepts and terms. I guess I wrote that last time, but the first one is isoelectronic. And the first word is actually the last thing on the worksheet right here. It talks about, um, they give you a bunch of um, atoms or ions, since we were the word species, like argon, sodium ion, vanadium, nitrite, and they say which of these are isoelectronic. Okay, so a little clue when you do that part, if you want to do it in a little bit after I go over this and then pause it and watch the rest, a clue to how to do that would be write out the configuration of all of them. You could probably get by with writing the short form electron configuration, and if they match, then they're isoelectronic. So I think I already told you that already. So I don't, I don't know if I have to do a whole lot, but I will. I will say something about it because it's something that will come into play later on. Um, like that one dealt with um, argon, iron, sulfide. Well, I'll do a different one. I'll do. I'll look at neon. I think I showed you this already. What is what is neon's electron configuration? Well, the regular or long one is one s two, two s two, two p six. Okay, I think I showed you that already on another worksheet. Now, um, the short form of neon would be, look at the, the noble gas that comes before it, helium, um, 2s2, ah, 2s2, 2p6. You don't really have to write, well, for that one, it's almost not really a short form. You're just writing he instead of 1s2, but oh well. We talked about that before. All right, here's the deal. Fluorine has electron configuration of, if it goes up, if neon is 2p6, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6, fluorine is 2p5. Okay, well, <coughs> the fluorine, I can actually bring this into play. This is going to be something you see later on. I'm going to show you. You know that there is something interesting about atoms, all the atoms, you know, this is a really cool thing because the periodic table was designed after electron configuration in quantum chemistry came up. If you go earlier than like those years, I guess early 1900s, the chart looked different. It didn't look like this, the shape and all this weird stuff. Well, there's a neat thing about that, but, but I'll just tell you that um, for now, one of the things that they, they noticed is atoms like to have, well, I say like, but atoms are more stable. They, it's still saying the word um, like. They're more stable, like we talked about before, 
um, ground up building, or they're more, um, how do you say, more stable or, more, or lower potential energy. Like, that would be high potential energy if I if I say I'm going to stack that that little um, that board up here. No, that's high potential because it's going to fall down. But if I keep it on my hands, lower, lower, put it on the floor, that's pretty much the lowest potential energy. Okay. So anyway, um, why did I say potential energy? Oh, the atoms have the lowest potential energy when their electron shells are full. And we say potential, it's kind of like saying two magnets would attract, right? A positive and a negative. Well, if fluorine, you don't think about it this way, but fluorine has all these electrons going around its nucleus. Remember, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead into some stuff right now, but well, I guess it won't hurt. I'm, I feel like saying it, so I will. Fluorine is positive nine nucleus, and it has five, six, seven, eight, nine electrons all around. So these electrons, as they move around, they, um, they pretty much... You know, if they were to move perfectly and all that, they cancel out, they neutralize the positive charge. Well, the thing is, it's most it's best done when you have a noble gas. Because when you have a noble gas, like neon, you have a positive 10, and it's like all the floors, the first floor, the second floor, are completely full in Hog Hotel. All the first floor is filled up. All that one and all that one. And there is... um. That is the that's the ideal the ideal um, ratio or whatever or positive to negative electrons. The ideal interaction is when you have all the hotel rooms full up to a certain level to match exactly what the nuclear charge is, and that's how all the noble gases are that way. All the noble gases have full what they call valence shells. Everything's full. So in other words, like for neon, if you want to add another electron in a neon, try to, try to make neon negative one, to add one more electron onto it, you have to go from 10 to 11, you have to go from the, what is that, 2p6, you got to add it in the 3s1. So now you have to go up above the 3s1. The problem with trying to add, just say if this were like, or if this were neon, okay, all the rooms full, everything's just all perfect or whatever, all the way up to level two. If I need to add one more electron, I suddenly have to go into this other room above that and add that one little electron. Now, neon doesn't have a nucleus strong enough to maintain that extra electron there. Now, sodium would, and so now we get back now, now we move up to another element. But so there's a balance between nuclear charge and electrons. And when the when the shells are full, there is a sort of an ideal, there's an ideal relationship. I, that was important to tell, more probably more for AP students, but everybody can, can see that. And even general, you're going to get it. I'm going to come back and say it again in, a, in later lessons. But watch this. So it makes sense. Fluorine, to be isoelectronic with neon, it needs to gain one electron. And you already know that, hey, when it gains one electron, negative one, or a better way to say it, you know that fluorine, all of these, this group forms negative one because these all need one electron to complete their valence, to, com to, to complete the um, valence, to fill the valence. So fluorine, fluoride, F negative one, and neon are isoelectronic. They have the same electron configuration. All right, let's go back to sodium because I, I mentioned sodium a moment, a moment ago. Or actually, let's go to magnesium. Magnesium, its electron configuration goes all the way up to 3s1, 3s2. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Well, what do you know about magnesium? Now, I told you that they, the atoms are pretty much reactive until they have a full valence. Well, here's the, the other side of that. Magnesium has a choice. It could go 3s2, level 3, and then, of course, you say, well, then you have 3p0. There are no... Three, the, the three P's are there, but they're empty for, for our magnesium. Well, do you want to gain six electrons, or could you lose two? If you lose these two electrons, now it becomes just like neon. And, and so it has the full all the way to the second shell. In fact, there's a little excess positive charge, but that excess positive charge is why magnesium, positive two charge, Magnesium will be able to attract to something like two fluorines to kind of balance that out. So 
The reason that atoms have the charges that you see there is because either they're gaining or they're losing outer electrons in order to um, in order to be isoelectronic to a noble gas. They're trying to get, and actually there's a word for that, and they like a lot in AP, and you'll never really have to say it much in general, but it's called a pseudo noble gas, pseudo noble gas um, configuration, pseudo noble gas electron configuration or configuration. So what that means is, see, F negative 1, this is not a noble gas, but it's matching, like a pseudo noble gas. But what the interesting thing is, and I think I mentioned before, if you have like fluorine, or it, it really F2, not just F, but we'll say F. F is highly reactive. Even F2 is highly reactive. Or magnesium. These would be reactive. But once, they, once fluorine changes to fluoride, and, or magnesium to Mg plus 2, then they're... We can use the word safe. They're really, they're, nothing's going to really happen. Sodium, I think I've told you about sodium metal, Na. That is extremely dangerous, dangerous stuff. If it just reacts with oxygen or moisture in the air, it'll, it'll blow up. It'll explode. You don't ever see that. It looks kind of like a Play-Doh. Imagine like silver Play-Doh. Kids would love like, wow, that's really cool. Well, they don't want to play with it very much unless if you were covered, believe it or not, if you cover it with baby oil or mineral oil, this Play-Doh, silver Play-Doh, you can play around with it for a little bit. Now, I'm not, we're not going to do that. No way. I don't let kids ever do that. Um, but because the, the oil keeps the moisture in the air, it protects it from that, from reacting, from drying out, drying out in the air or from, um, from getting moisture from the air and blowing up. Well, anyway, why am I saying that? Well, sodium, you know that you have sodium every single day. You need it. Your nervous system needs it. So... But you don't have, it's not really sodium, it's sodium ion. So Na is 3S1. It loses one electron, it becomes like neon. Once you have sodium ion, then you can drink it, you can eat it. It's in table salt. It's safe, no problem at all, not reactive. It's going to stay Na plus one. Now, if you can change it to Na, that's a dangerous reaction there. But then you'll make it, you'll make it react, uh, reactive. Okay, so I went, I went a little bit further to let you know about that. But that'll, that'll make it easier when it comes around later on. So, now, <clears throat> the key word, though, isoelectronic means has the same electron configuration. I'll tell you one thing about the worksheet, and you'll find it on your own. It is possible that there could be two atoms, or an, an atom and like a, a plus one ion or a negative two ion. There can be two, two things that have the same number of electrons, but they don't have the same electron configuration. I'll let you try to figure that out when you do the worksheet. Now, what I just showed you a moment ago, I erased it, but you can want to go back. Neon, F negative 1, and Mg plus 2, they all are 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 6, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They all have 10 electrons. Neon, F negative 1, and um, whatever I said, magnesium plus 2, and sodium plus 1 all have 10 electrons. So they're isoelectronic, and they have the same number of electrons. But you can have the same number of electrons and not be isoelectronic. Ah, what does that mean? Well, that means your electrons might be in different places. Okay, but, but you'll see. And that's a really an AP thing. But you'll have fun. You guys will all of you, even the general, you guys can do this worksheet and you can figure that out. Okay. All right. So that's the first word. The next thing I already, oh, I'm, I mentioned to you ground state. And I'm going to talk about excited. I, I told you ground and excited state. Um, okay. Now, this is something, um, all, right, state. all right, this is something that's more like, I found this in a work, in a, in a textbook once, I thought, hey, it's pretty good, it's just some exercises to make sure that you really understand electron configuration, really right, right here, this middle part, so I told you about isoelectronic, we just did that, so we're going backwards, now for the middle part, and then I'll do that part last, for the middle part, it says, Identify which element you see here, and then whether or not it is in the ground state, the excited state, or impossible. So, um, now, let me say a little bit about ground and excited, because I'm going to talk more about that in a later lesson as well. It's one that, I say later, but it's one that comes before this one, earlier. Um, an amazing discovery, one of the reasons that we led, that led um, scientists to the quantum model and the electron configuration, is that an atom any atoms at all, they can absorb energy 
when they absorb energy, their electrons um, are, they move to higher levels. Higher, they become excited temporarily. Now, it's interesting because when light shines on you and you see all the colors, like I have gray here, or if I have, you know, this, you see yellow here as well. The chemicals that are in this are actually absorbing, absorbing certain wavelengths of light and reflecting certain wavelengths of light. You probably heard someone say, if you have a red shirt, that what it means is that you're absorbing all the colors, all, all the wavelengths of light except for red, and that one is being bounced back. It's not being absorbed. And that's true about pigments, about solids. Now, with light, it's very different. Um, light is strange. We'll talk about that later on. But for now, that's just a neat thing to know that energy, the e light energy even, energy can be absorbed by an atom and its electrons jump to higher levels. Then those atoms, um, okay, so let's be write that down for a minute. So let's just put one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just, let me just do that, six electrons. That will be an atom of carbon, okay? 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, All right, carbon, is that right? Yeah, six electrons. I should know that anyway in carbon. All right, you can look on the chart there and see. Now, <clears throat> if um if an atom of carbon, if we we can add energy to it in the form of electricity, or in the form of light, light even, and what happens is these electrons will become excited. Now they're going to jump to some higher level. Now where they're going to jump, you don't have to know, and it's beyond even the AP class, and even beyond me. I, I don't even. I never really got into that too deep at all. Like how far? Where would the electrons go? But but let's just say if I put a, first of all one s two two s two two p two. Let's just make up something. One two. Let's let's say three, four. Let's put one there, and let's see. And then we'll put okay. So one two three four five, and we'll just put I don't know that. Okay. So if I if I wrote down well I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's go put one in. We'll, we'll keep one down at the bottom. So if I wrote down 1s1, 2p1, 3p1, 4s2, and then 3d1. If I wrote that down, if I did write it down, like, okay, is this excited state? Is it ground state or impossible? Well, we would say this is excited. Because, here's why, 1s1, 2p1, 3p1, 4s2, 3d1. It is possible that that could happen. Now, that would only exist for just a moment in time, like a burst of electricity or light, boom, the electrons jump. But then the very next split second, they fall down. Now, I'll talk about this in a later video, but when they fall down, they release energy in the, in the form of light. And uh, uh, just kind of a goofy little way that I always show it. If I want to, we talked about endothermic, exothermic. Maybe, well, maybe not in the general class, but if I add energy, if I want to take this little cap lid and lift it up, I have to add energy to do that against gravity. It's not just going to fly up there, okay? I, I add energy. Now, once it's there, look at what happens. There is energy. It gains potential energy to fall back down. So what we're saying is we can excite it, the electron goes to a higher level, but then it releases that same amount of energy as it falls down. And for the atom, when it, when it falls down, it releases energy in the form of light and different colors of light. It could be even invisible light, but we'll, we'll get that later. All right, but it goes from excited back to ground state. Everything, so it might be like this for a moment, that the very next split second it's going to go right back down to this again, unless you continuously put in energy and so forth. And so like when you're standing there, the light is constantly shining on like on me right now. So you're, you're seeing this gray. Uh oh, there's some chalk dust there too. Okay. But you're seeing your constant, it's constantly the electrons are up, down, up, down, up, down, and so forth and go on, on, on. All right. Now impossible. Now there's nothing impossible. It's just something a, a textbook added in, but it is absolutely something that could be asked on AP as well. Um, they want to make sure you really know your 1s2, 2s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, all that, all the order. Okay, so if I wrote something like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p, um, 2p, 2p6, 
3S4, 3P1. Well, okay, that probably caught you right there. 3S4, well, that's impossible because S cannot hold four electrons. It can only hold two. Well, if I wrote 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, um, 2D3, that would hopefully trigger something you say, oh, wait a minute, there is no such thing as a 2D, okay? There is no there is no 2Ds. Ds don't appear until the third level. Okay, so that's kind of what we mean by impossible. Now, I could mix them together, you know, I, I'm not really planning on that, but 1S2, 2P1, 3, 3S, you know, if you did anything like 3D, um, 3D14, well, that would be impossible now because Ds can only hold 10. So it is excited, that's true, but the fact that you put 14 in the D makes the whole thing impossible. So, you know, I, anyway, I just wanted to kind of bring that little section up. So if if you wanted to, you would do, for this section, you, would just, you could do it right now. Which element is it? Well, the key, we're going to assume that all of these are... Um, are neutral. There, there are no positive ones or negative twos, no ions. That's what I'm going to say. So if you just add up the electrons, you'll know what symbol, what element it likely will be. And then here you'll write down whether it is excited, ground, or if it is um, impossible. Okay, and we're almost done with this section. And finally, this worksheet will be over with. So this is maybe one of the, the coolest, amazing science things that we get in this uh, sci predictor of science phenomenon. This is a neat. This is neat stuff here, and it's called paramagnetism, diamagnetism, ferromagnetism. First, I'll tell you that the word ferro, F-E-R-R-O, has to do with iron, and we know that iron is magnetic. Okay, and then these two terms, paramagnetic, diamagnetic. Ha! Ah, well, why does science have to pick words like that? Magnetic is just good enough for me if I say magnetic or not magnetic. That would be good enough. But instead, they decide to use paramagnetic, diamagnetic. So I guess they want to be more better terminology. But, but when they ask questions, they usually say, is this element magnetic or not? Will it, will it be influenced by a magnetic field? Yes or no? Okay. So it's interesting. They ask it that way, but then they give you these words that you can use, and they can use the words too. Okay. So... This is an interesting thing. So again, I, I can't tell you guys how much, how what an amazing like science discovery it was in quantum science. When this was all figured out, you can just imagine when scientists realized, hey, we can, we're going to rearrange the chart in this order according to the S, P, D, and F. Okay, they did that. Um, but once they did that, a lot of stuff in nature can be explained that they didn't know before. And, it, and it's amazing. It's really incredible. But one thing is, you know, I'm sure scientists, before they knew about electron configuration, so that would be anywhere in the 1800s and even earlier, sure, all those early scientists, I mean, Charles, Boyle, Avogadro, Gilusak, we talked about all these people, they probably knew that, hey, um, sodium positive one, okay? They probably knew a lot of these ions, their charges. They didn't know why they had those charges, but now we know why because of electron configuration. Well, here's another thing that's neat. Some elements are magnetic. They will be influenced by a magnetic field. Now, obviously, you know iron is because you take a magnet, a refrigerator, the refrigerator has iron behind that. Steel, steel is iron. Steel is iron with um, that's been refined, with has carbon in it, believe it or not. They mix carbon and iron together. Uh, we'll talk about that in a later chapter. We are. It, um, but anyway, what happens? The magnet goes on the, on the, on the board. It sticks. Okay, but if you try to put it against like a penny or something, you don't see it happening. That doesn't mean the penny is not magnetic. It just means it's not strong enough. If you had a really strong or electromagnetic, other things would be able to attract. So anyway, this, can, this electron configuration can predict whether or not an element is magnetic. And why that matters, I think I told you about this in a much earlier, in earlier lessons, earlier chapter, but say that you have like a, a charged particle or, you know, well, first of all, we know if you have a charged particle, like a, a positive two charged particle or whatever, and in a particle accelerator, just think that little particle is flying, you get it flying along in a lab, like a little, like a little bullet. You're shooting that thing along a little positive two. But then you have a magnet right here. And what the magnet can do, depending on how it's set up, the magnet can cause it to 
deflect. Remember, we talked about that. A magnet, magnetic field, it will influence it. Well, if this had zero charge, and the way we did that, if you want to go even more technical, we had to remove the electrons from the atom. Then we shot the nucleus through. So that would be like a helium nucleus being shot through. And it, and it, it, it bends when it passes the magnet. Well, if it were a neutral particle, how about just a helium atom that has two protons and two neutrons, zero charge? Well, now that thing's going to go right on through. It's not going to be affected by a magnetic field. But now the reason why, it's not just because it's a zero charge. It has to do with its electrons. Why is helium not magnetic? Okay, it's very, very simple answer, but they chose two weird words to explain this. Every element will be either what's called paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Now, first of all, what's the easiest way to say this? I'll tell you the definitions, they're going to tell you the real easy way to remember it. All right, paramagnetic is any, if the, if the, um, the species, I'll say the species has, or the atom, whatever, ion, has unpaired, unpaired electrons. Okay, all right, if, it's, if it has unpaired electrons, it will be magnetic, you can say that if you want to, or influenced. In, oh gosh, this chalk is running out. That's why I'm using every bit, every drop. It will be influenced by a magnetic field, or it will be affected by a magnetic field. Anything that's paramagnetic is an, a, a, an, an ion or atom or a molecule even that has unpaired electrons. It will be influenced by a magnetic field. Okay. Diamagnetic has, is the opposite. Has all paired electrons. Now, here is the easy way to remember these two, and you will probably not forget it. The word is di. The bad word here is para, because para almost sounds like pair, but it's not P-A-I-R, it's para. So the, the, the word to remember here is di. You know di means two. So watch this, and you're going to always remember it with this little diagram. Up, down, electrons. If every room in Hog Hotel looks like that, then that element will not be magnetic. So here we go. I'll show you. We can go right through the list and tell you which elements are or not, and you'll be able to figure it out. Hydrogen has one electron. Does that show up on there? Yeah. Hydrogen has one electron. Ah, I have been erasing and hitting this thing so much that you can't even see it well anymore, but I think you'll get it. Hey, I know what to do. I'll use, this is the last one I'm doing, so I'll use another color. So hydrogen has one electron. Yes, it will be influenced by magnetic field. It's paramagnetic. It will be magnetic. Hydrogen, one electron. Two electrons for helium. It is diamagnetic. All of the rooms have two electrons. It will be, um, it will not be influenced, sorry, will not be influenced by a magnetic field. Okay? Lithium is the next element. Number three, yes, it's magnetic, paramagnetic. Beryllium, diamagnetic. All the rooms have twos. Okay, now it gets to be fun. We get to at the beryllium, then we get to boron on the chart. <coughs> yes, magnetic. Yes, magnetic. Yes. So the next three are magnetic. Okay. Now, guess what? Yes, that's magnetic. So if you have even one room with one electron alone, it will be influenced by a magnetic field. So what do you think? Would you be more influenced by, by a magnet if you have a lot of rooms with one electron or if you have only, you know, a, a large number of rooms or small? And the answer is a, a large number. So if you have extreme um, like having three would be more magnetic. Well, anyway, that would be diamagnetic again. And now we got to neon, All right, right there, neon. One is two, two is two, two be six. So it will be, it will be um, um, non. It will be diamagnetic. I guess every noble gas will have to be diamagnetic. Now you can't really make. There, there are some patterns here and there you might be able to figure out, but there'll be exceptions as well. So all right, so that's it. Now, there's one more word that's in there, and that is ferromagnetic. And I never see that in many other places. But iron, look at iron for a moment. Iron goes up to 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3D, 6. 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
So the, having four unpaired electrons, that's part of it, and part of it will be you know its nucleus as well. But but that is highly magnetic, highly magnetic iron. You would think that if you take one back, that right before iron, that manganese would also be pretty magnetic. So, um, but you know it's it's interesting though. You can try and test it in class. We might not have enough. Um, there might might not be enough. Uh, attractive the force on, on the magnet so it's a lot more involved than just that than, than, than simply picking a magnet and checking them because you wouldn't be able to see it but an amazingly cool thing okay and this is beyond AP and I, I might even talk about it a little bit in AP we used to have it in AP we did but then they took it out some years ago but this is electron configuration for an atom or an ion but there is also an electron configuration for a molecule. Isn't that weird? So it, they call it molecular orbital, molecular orbitals, molecular orbital configuration. Um, so what does that mean? Well, here's the bottom line. Molecules can also be magnetic or not magnetic. And H2O water is magnetic, and it's really cool. And I think you may have seen it. If you, I don't know if you, if you guys did the UCLA program or when uh, Mr. Walker um, some of you, well, only if you're in honors or AP, you may have seen it, but he did this thing and he had a, a stream of water going down and put a magnet and it, it pulls it. So you can do that. If you have a real thin stream of water dripping down, maybe, maybe get like a water bottle and put a real small thin hole right there and get a magnet next to it. And you'll see that it will be, it will, um, it will be affected by a magnetic field. Or you can also do it with a balloon instead of if you don't have a magnet book balloon and rub it like on on a fur or cloth or whatever or anything like that and it will the static electricity in there will be will, will repel the the water flowing down well anyway okay some cool stuff so now you can do the top part so we did that worksheet backwards yay we're finished with this and ready to move on so i'll see you guys later